Hello, everyone, and welcome to another webinar from Cardemotion. Uh, in this uh, opportunity, we will be with Beatriz Martinez. She will be speaking about uh, switch on my features, uh, about continuous deployment, um, delivery, and all that stuff. Uh, I will leave you with her to uh, deliver the presentation. And if you have any questions, don't forget that you have two options. One, it's uh, through the chat or to the questions uh, window. And another option is uh, by raising uh, your hand. So welcome, Beatrice, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for, for having me and to uh, assist this webinar. Uh, I hope it will be really useful uh, for, for all of us. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Katrin, and uh, I'm currently working in Isovalent, is a um, Silicon Valley startup, the company behind the open source project uh, Cilium, that you may know if you work with uh, cloud environments and with Kubernetes networking. And previous to that, I worked during seven years at IBM. And mainly, I think all my career dedicated to cloud environments and infrastructure. And another additional data about me, I'm really passionate about technology and innovation. And um, thanks to this, I'm usually dedicated to new topics that arise around technology, even, with, uh, even if I don't dedicate myself in my day to day to, to those specific topics. Okay, so um, switch on my features. What, what are we going to, to talk about today? When we develop new products, we pursue success in terms of um, when we add new feature, we fix in bugs, we deliver improvements uh, with every new release, every new software version. All, do we, uh, all that we want is to provide our users with their needs, with the necessities. Uh, we want to build the product that they are looking for. That's what success means, that we build uh, the application, the software, the product that our customers and our users uh, want to be using. In this talk, I would like to embrace two factors that will help us, uh, our users want to use our product. The first one is the new approaches, the new paradigm to software development, as continuous delivery, continuous deployment, that allow us to quickly iterate and test new features and versions as often as we need. Um, we will see different examples how to implement this. And the second factor uh, will be, be user-driven. Uh, in the end, our users are the ones to determine the success of our software. So why not put that first, like um, that our decisions are driven by our users' feedback, our users' insight. Okay, so um, in the end, what I would like to show during this webinar is how we can take advantage of the development workflows that we follow with continuous delivery, continuous deployment to gain insights from our users. For example, which features are more likely to be successful? How do our users react to an version? Which design is preferred? So we can make them decisions driven by those insights. Um, let's continue with uh, an overview of the topics that we are going to be covering. And uh, first, we are, I'm going to start with a um, short um, definition of feature release. Then I would like to have with you a journey of uh, the different approaches that we have been we've had traditionally and how we have been evolving those in terms of um, the development life cycles, but also how we deliver in the infrastructure and we bring value to our users. We've been changing the methodologies, the approaches, the practices. So we will see how we've been evolving in that aspect. And finally, we are going to focus the talk in examples uh, of the different strategies, the different approaches that we can have uh, to deploy uh, and that will enable us, as I mentioned, like bring and have uh, visibility uh, from the feedback or insight of the users. And uh, we will have two different approaches, two different strategies. Uh, point three will be based on infrastructure side. And then in point four, we are going to see also examples of deployment strategies based not only on the infra side, but also on the code aspects, um, feature flags. Okay, so uh, moving for the next topic, feature release. What do we understand for feature release? We continuously evolve our software, our product. 
why do we do this? Because we want to improve the user experience. We want to adapt to the market changes. Uh, also, we need to fix some bugs that may appear. And we implement new functionalities and new features that maybe have been requested by our users or our customers. Usually, the development of a new product has a beginning and a final deadline. When we need to deliver the whole project, the whole product, like a final release. But if we, um, if we focus in the uh, bottom uh, draw, um, not necessarily we need to deliver all the functionalities in that final deadline, in that final release. Um, and then it's like we've been developing from the beginning and we just open to the public the application when it's finished. Uh, instead, if we now focus in the right, um, in the picture on the right, uh, we can follow an iterative process. Uh, and we can deliver features uh, iterative in different stages, in different phases. So we gather feedback from our users in every one of these cycles. And this can help us shape our product and change it accordingly to the new user knowledge that we have gained. So if, if we see uh, this picture on the right and this new approach, we have two aspects to pay attention to. The first is that we are going to be constantly building, constantly deploying new releases, new versions of the software, new features. And second, uh, that we are going to be gathering feedback from the users and using this feedback uh, then in the next cycle. Okay. Now, um, let's see how do we get here. Um, this that you can see here is the waterfall development life cycle. Um, nowadays, we've been uh, evolving. We have two main different approaches or methodologies that we could be following um, to um, develop and to deliver uh, new versions, new releases. The first one will be the most traditional approach that we've been having, this waterfall development life cycle. It follows a sequential liner steps. Uh, the first one, um, requirements, and the team that is focused on this step uh, we'll have into account the necessities of the users in that specific moment of the time. Then we move to the next uh, step, uh, would be design. We design, having in mind those necessities, the full set of features um, that, that we are going to be covering. And then we move for the next uh, sequential steps. Uh, we implement them, we test those, and then we finally deliver and deploy the final version of the product. In this approach, uh, it's very difficult to react to changes. Uh, we will need to start from the initial steps and we don't uh, practice continuously um, getting feedback from the user. We, we don't in iterate. Usually, um, well-defined teams will be involved in every step. Uh, as not that much interaction is really needed between them, uh, we just move from one step to the next one um, once. So the responsibilities uh, and the structure of the organization are considered on uh, the, is, the responsibilities is split in because there are lower, lower communication in, in the different teams. For example, um, the team of developers or software engineers developing the features, taking requirements from product design and rarely interact with the system administrators that are going to be maintaining the infrastructure where the application is finally going to be delivered to the users or deployed. What we have today is something uh, really different from this. Uh, we've been evolving towards a completely different model. Um, we have new methodologies, uh, structures on the team, in the organization, all, all uh, the ecosystem has been changing to adapt to this new model. Uh, even we have new practices or new roles within the teams that have arised. I'm going to mention like a couple examples uh, that I'm sure have been uh, the two that bring to your mind as I started mentioning um, the changes. So the first one will be, in generally speaking, agile methodologies applied to the development lifecycle. The steps are really similar to the waterfall, even could be the same. Uh, from requirements, uh, plan, design, develop, release. But then we monitor uh, and track and gain feedback uh, from the users in every iteration, in every cycle, going again through all the steps. So we have continuous cycles. Um, it is very flexible, allowing us to quickly react 
and continuously evolving uh, with the market and with our user preferences. We also have our customers and our users involved. And as a consequence of this new iterative model, um, we are going to, we, we have a change in the organization. Um, right now we have a multidisciplinary team, a collaborative that take ownership for all the life cycle. We also have uh, the second uh, example that I have here, which is the DevOps culture, or uh, DevOps methodology, the new practices uh, that are enabled. Um, acts as a bridge between the different cross-functional teams, development, quality assurance, security um, deployment, also networking, infrastructure, simplifying the process. Uh, it aids a faster deliveries through automation. So we have then real-time tracking and monitoring of the deploy application behavior. So we have two different factors here. One um, that we use during the development of the features, uh, the development of the, or, or the back fixing, or the development of the software product. And we have like an agile methodology that allow us to have different cycles, different iterations constantly with the feedback. And then with DevOps methodologies or the DevOps culture, this allow us the part of once that we have developed the changes, also deploy those into the infrastructure, into the um, different production environments. And at the same time, the DevOps culture and all the practices that bring together allow us to gain feedback from uh, those environments that we have deployed and our users. And we use all that information for the next cycle, the next iteration. So both examples, enable continuous delivery of value and gain feedback and insights from our users or our customers in real time so we can improve and save the next stage or the next cycle. Uh, now, um, last slide before we move uh, towards the deployment strategies. Um, I wanted to reflect the importance of having in mind our users, the user-centric, uh, designed our development life cycle, our organization structure, our practices, our methodologies, all of those focus on the user and monitor the behavior and adapt the features. I would like to take this slide so all of us can be aware that the digital transformation that we are living is all about this. All successful products are focused on providing the user better experience. It is not about getting there first anymore, even being there after others. If we do best for the users, if we quickly adapt, we can gain the market. A couple of examples of customer centricity. Uh, first of those, Amazon Prime, the internet's most successful membership program. And if you know the story of Amazon Prime uh, that now uh, have over 100 million paying members, it all started with a customer pain point. Charlie Ward, uh, was at the time principal engineer, now is the VP of technology, said, um, wouldn't it be great if customers just gave us a chunk uh, of change at the beginning of the year and we calculated zero for the shipping charges for the rest of the year? And at that moment, everyone thought that Charlie had gone crazy. But that was the beginning, paying attention to a pain point for the user for the most successful membership program. Another example uh, that I um, included here is Slack. Slack monitors the opinion and the needs of the users constantly and directly treat those as future requests. If we pay attention uh, at the software side, we can also see that in the last years, we have been an increase in the practices uh, that are focused on the user. And a couple of examples to mention, uh, seven factors for user experience design or design thinking. Um, I've, I have uh, here a screenshot for an empathy map in which the user is always the center. So user centric. Um, gathering the info that we have uh, until right now. So we are going, we are evolving, we are moving towards new methodologies, new practices, new approaches, new even organization structure that will allow us to quickly adapt, quickly iterate. And all the decisions need to be driven by the users. So from the deployment um, side of it, that we are going to focus the talk, we need to pay attention to two aspects. The first one is that we need to be able to constantly 
uh, deploy, to constantly deliver value, to constantly uh, iterate, improve, doing this in short cycles. That includes the development methodology and also the strategies for the deployment. But we also need to pay attention to a second aspect that truly really matters, that is gathering in every of these stages, gathering feedback from the user, gathering insights, how this is working. Moving forward to these two aspects, deployment strategies that could allow us both of those aspects. Quickly deploy, constantly deploy, continuous deploy, and gather feedback from our users in every of those stages. So until recently, the process of deploy on working environments uh, or applications was low cost efficiency and uh, it used to be a static. It meant infrastructure management or hosting services that really didn't bring that much value. Deploy a new release or a new software version meant prior planning, even weeks before uh, the execution, uh, program intervention consuming hours, and usually it also implies um, service interruption. Today, thanks to cloud environments and all the ecosystem created around it, we can start leaving all those behind. So we have available resources such as uh, Kubernetes that we could even consider the new operating system on top of which we can deploy and run our applications. And at the same time, we gain more value on other aspects such um, high availability, scalability, cost optimization. But Kubernetes uh, don't provide always all the functionalities that we need to assess, measure, gain feedback and insights from the users. As you mentioned, um, if you remember the two factors, uh, Kubernetes is going to enable us continuously deploy and continuously deliver new applications, new versions, but not always is going to be enough to provide the second aspect, gain feedback, uh, visualize, observability, measure um, from the users. And remember that was also one of the key points of the digital transformation. So we need sometimes additional software, additional layers that we can have here. Like for example, Istio could enable some of those. Um, one of the really uh, pro cons here, um, pro points, is that we don't really need to be experts in any of these technologies to be able to take advantages of the functionality they provide. Nowadays, cloud providers and many other services provide those um, as serverless options that we don't need to manage. Uh, so for example, Firebase or Netlify. Okay, uh, so uh, let's move now into the um, examples of these deployment strategies. We have here um, some of the examples that we are going to be uh, to see in more detail below. Uh, it's important that we are aware of all the available strategies, or at least some of the most common strategies that are available uh, for us in order to deliver, in order to constantly deploy new features, new releases, new uh, software versions, and how we can implement those. Uh, in the left, you have like several aspects that uh, it would be nice to take into account when we need to make the right decision in terms of what is the appropriate deployment strategy for my specific use case? And some of the points that we could consider here are, for example, the, the cloud costs, um, the impact on the end users, uh, if we need zero downtime or we can't um, have some uh, minutes downtime in the application, the impact that we are going to have on the system, um, the complexity of the setup of the strategy, um, the rollback duration, if we need to target the specific users uh, for the strategy. Okay, so having in mind some of these aspects, we could make a decision on which one will be the appropriate strategy uh, for us. Now I would like to move into the next session in which we are going to start um, seeing in more detail some of these strategies, starting for those um, based on infrastructure, and then we will see those based on the code changes. Okay, so uh, first one of these strategies um, in, uh, based on the infrastructure. Uh, first of all, um, you are going to see really cool uh, animations and GIF. Uh, I haven't really made those um, at the end, uh, which I linked, um, I link in the slide for the source of, of these animations provide those. 
Um, so instead of redoing a good work, I just use uh, his. So now moving to, to the first strategy, recreate. This is the most simple one. Um, the steps consist in, we have deployed um, one version of our application, version one, with all the replicas there on the, on the left. And this strategy consists in um, first remove this first version, all the replicas for the application, so completely erase, remove it. And then second step, deploy the new release with a new version. Uh, it's the most simple one. Um, it is. It was used commonly used from the pre-cloud era, or most um, most used also in on-premise infrastructure environments. Um, one of the of the cons is that implies downtime for the service, so it will have high impact on the user. And you could say, okay, um, when it will be a good idea, why would we choose this strategy? Um, so, for example, if we have a software that depends on a specific hardware, and we don't have we don't have more infrastructure available, so it will be impossible to have uh, more than one uh, more than one version deployed at the same time. We will need to first remove all the uh, replicas and all the deployments for the first version before we can start deploying the new release. So that will be a constraint that uh, will make us use this kind of a strategy, for example. Next one. Uh, this will be the most uh, well known if uh, you are accustomed to use Kubernetes environments. Uh, it's called RAMP rolling update or incremental. And I mentioned this because it's the default strategy for Kubernetes. So you will be um, used to it if, if you work in these kind of environments. Um, the, the steps to perform this strategy for deploy uh, will be, um, first we deploy uh, just an initial replica of the new version of the application version two. And then we are going to do this at the same time. As, as we start removing um, some of the replicas for the initial version one, we grow the number of replicas for the new two. So we are going to evolve this like, like a round. At the same time that we are removing um, the replicas for the version one, we are increasing those for the version two until we finally have a full rollout. It usually, um, um, it, it's also easy to easy to set up. Um, we, it can be used with uh, stateful applications. That will be also a, a pro. Um, even, but those will need to handle uh, revalidating the data. So, for example, if a specific number of replicas is required, um, you remove one, then you will add the next one, and one by one, we'll, we will be maintaining the application stability. Uh, so it will be adequate if, if we are trying to migrate or have new version for a stateful applications that need specific state. Cons, um, it can take time. Uh, it depends also on the specific application. If we have only three replicas, uh, it wouldn't be a problem. But if your application has hundreds of replicas and it's a complex one, it, it could take more time. So it could take time uh, for both rollout and rollback. And also, um, different team from, from the, the ones that we are going to explain next, uh, in this strategy, we don't have control over the traffic. Okay, uh, moving to the third one. Um, this is also well known. Um, it's called blue-green. Uh, the, the different steps that we are going to have is we deploy the uh, new release fully fully deploy the release, like all the replicas that we need, but we don't send traffic yet. So we have the full production environment with our initial version one working, receiving all the production traffic. And at the same time, we have the full replicas and the full new version of our application also deployed. We can then uh, do some testing and assess that it works correctly. And then uh, once that we ensure that the new version is, is working, we redirect uh, all the traffic from the version one to the version two, and then we could erase or remove the initial version. Um, I mentioned that some of these strategies 
can be implemented uh, with only, for example, Kubernetes or from the infra side. And for others, we will need additional software. In this case, it can be performed uh, only by using Kubernetes, for example. How will you do a blue-green deployment uh, using only Kubernetes? So first environment, we have our version one uh, deploy there. In Kubernetes, this would be a deployment, for example, with several replicas, several pods, and we will have a service object pointing to all those pods of the service. Um, this is configured because in the service we are using a selector with a specific level that is configured in all the different replicas. So we have this situation. Then, step two, we will deploy the new deployment with all the replicas with the new version of the, of the application. Um, and in this new version, all the pods, all the replicas will have a different level value. So all the traffic is going to be redirected from the service to all the replicas in the version one. So all our deployment with version two and all those replicas are still set up, but we don't have any service pointed out there yet. In this situation, we can safely do all the testing that we need with the new version two. And when we are ready, we will redirect all the traffic. How we do this? Uh, so uh, we edit the service and instead of having uh, the selector pointed to the level of the version one replicas, we change that to the new uh, specific level for the version two. And automatically, all the traffic that goes to the service is going to be redirected to the new version. It really also um, easy to, to set up only with, with Kubernetes. In this case, um, one of the process that we can do instant rollout and also instant rollback, just changing, for example, in this environment, phone level, uh, if something goes wrong. And one of the cons is that we, we will need double resources, double infrastructure, because we will need uh, to have the application deployed twice at the same time. So it can be expensive. Okay, uh, next one. Shadow. Um, this one is pretty similar to the previous one, but uh, we are going to use uh, real production traffic for the testing. So as the same that we did with the blue-green, uh, we are going to maintain all the production traffic going to the version one. We are going to deploy the full version two application with all the replicas there. And then uh, with the blue green, we did some testing, if you remember. In this case, if we apply shadow, it consists of doing the testing by mirroring the production traffic to the new version that uh, we are going to test if it responds as expected. And so the testing is done with real traffic, but we are not impacting the, the user. Um, to set this up, in this case, it's not, it's not that simple. Um, it can be complex to set up because we need a tool that allow us to mirror that traffic. Um, it would be very easy uh, done, but we, we need an additional software. In this case, we cannot implement this only using Kubernetes, for example. We will need um, a service mess, for example, Istio, or, and also um, not every traffic can always be mirrored without impacting any other system. So also to take it into, into consideration. Um, this is useful, this approach, if we want to really test uh, with the production load on, on a new feature. Okay. Next one. Um, this is uh, also uh, well, well known, at least the name of it, Canary Deployment. And first, I would like to, to pay attention to the name, canary. Why? Why do we call this canary deployment, like a bird? It's like, so uh, the use of this word came really from, from years, years behind, from 1926, to be more exact. And um, I would like to, to share with you the story of uh, why um, this strategy is called canary. And it's because canary birds, uh, were used in the mines in that times, 1926, to test in the mines the presence of the carbon um, monoxide, of if we have less oxygen, let's 
So every miner, human miner, uh, or had a canary um, close to close to them uh, in a cage, and they were constantly monitoring the status of the uh, the state of of the canary of the bird. Um, if the bird uh, start reacted, uh, starting getting nervous, or or even um, it could even die. Uh, that that could mean that uh, we have reduced the oxygen in the mines, and then automatically all the humans run out of the mines there. So they used a canary to test how was uh, the thing going into the mine. Okay, so we have enough oxygen, yes. Okay, and use that canary, that small bird, to assess if it was safe for all the human miners to go in or they need to go out. So this is the this is the name of this strategy deployment. Why? Um, now let's explain uh, what this uh, strategy consists on, and uh, we will all also understand why the name. So in this deployment, we will have um, we will deploy a new release, um, and then gradually we are going to shift real production traffic from our previous version one to the new version two. So this will be like, okay, uh, from some real users, real traffic, let's assess how the situation is. It's well like when we uh, have our canary bird inside the mine, like directly, and see how this goes. If, if this goes wrong and the canary bird could die, and in this case, those users, the small traffic, those production users uh, will have a break uh, version of the application that we are risking there. And if all goes uh, okay, then okay, more humans can go into the mine. So okay, more more percentage of traffic can go to the new to the new version to the new release. Usually, the traffic is split based on weight. So for example, it will be 90% of the request going to the original version one, and only 10% of the traffic go to version two. And then, if it's safe, if everything goes right. Uh, we will gradually increment the traffic to the new version until uh, it receives 100% of the traffic and we will complete the full rollout and remove uh, the initial version. This technique, this technique is uh, mostly used when the tests are lacking or not reliable or there is little confidence about the stability of the new release or the platform. Okay. And finally, the last one based on infrastructure will be A-B testing. This is not um, a deployment strategy per se, this is a testing strategy. So the outcome uh, is not that we have at the end um, one the version two completely released or perform a full rollout that we only have first one version, then second version. This is a strategy that's used for testing um, different features version at the same time. And the outcome will be to gather feedback from the testing of those different versions and make a business decision on, on, on those. So we, have, we need to be careful with this technique because it's not suitable for all applications. It is mainly focused on web or mobile applications um, when we can measure how the users behave. This approach will allow us to assess, for example, two different functionalities at the same time, uh, and then decide uh, which one is working better for the user, and then only develop or deploy interpretation that's the, the one that works better. So we are going to make a business decision based on the feedback that we are going to gather for the user thanks to this strategy. It is very important that users uh, that are configured to see one specific version, A, um, always see the same version A and users that are going to be redirected to version B are going to be always seeing that version B. So we don't want randomly changing versions uh, from the use of the users. This will make our users crazy, for example. And more important, um, we will need to have consistent information to make the right decisions. So um, we can implement this by using uh, infrastructure or by specific systems that allow us to measure conversion. Uh, so some examples could be Google Optimize or Optimizely, or also through feature flag systems. Um, we can decide uh, based on um, the cookies, um, query parameters, 
geolocalization, um, the type of browser that a user uh, is using, for example, a mobile or desktop, or even the language. It is usually a technique for marketing business decision based on statistics. However, um, sometimes Google needs to support from the underlying infrastructure also to achieve this. Okay, A B testing. And well, um, now it's uh, time to make the change for the different strategies for deployment also, but in this case, based on the application or based on the code. So um, we will see now a different way to deliver new functionalities to our users. Um, let's see what, what are feature flags or feature toggle systems. They differ from the previous that uh, we've been going through in that they are application based. So, uh, and because of, and, and because of this, um, they allow us to enable or disable functionalities dynamically, even after our code has been deployed. So this would be like changing the code without really needing to deploy that change into, into the new infrastructure or system. Okay, let, let's, let's go more into detail. So with feature flags, we will need to also instrument our applications. Um, this means adding a specific code that let us decide how do we want to enable some features. We can simply turn a feature on and off remotely uh, but we could also target specific user segments, for example, um, based on region or based on the type of subscription they have purchased. So we can also do canary deployments or gradual rollout based on the percentage or even A-B testing. We can schedule a release or a feature. Uh, imagine that we want to present our new marketing campaign on next Monday um, 8 a.m. in the morning. We can set this up uh, the week before and just schedule it until our feature flag system. Or even we can have beta testers program and allow users to voluntarily test new features and opt in, opt out whenever they want. As part, um, a, a, apart from adding new code to our application, we will need to have um, a feature flag system which acts as a backend our application will communicate with this feature flag system and decide which features are on and which are off. Okay. So um, there are several feature flag system already available. Um, here are some examples. Um, some of those are commercial, others are open source and free to use. Um, Launched largely, for example, is one of the most popular and it has commercial version. Uh, rollout.io is from CloudBees, the Jenkins main contributors. Ballet Train is a good alternative. It is open source. Uh, you can set it up in your own servers. Um, and they also they also offer as plan as a service. And Leash is an other open source alternative. And then ConfigCat. It's commercial one, uh, it's, but it's relatively new. And um, I'm going to focus the net examples on that specific one. So let's see a short uh, demo um, on how all of these feature flag things work. <laughs> and we will use ConfigCat for it. So which is um, offer as a service and we don't need to set it up in advance or maintain it. So it's really simple. That's why I choose it for, for the example. And they also offer generous free plan. And by the way, if you have GitHub Student Pack, um, a larger plan is included for free also. ConfigCat has a visual dashboard from which we will configure the rules for our application. And they also offer multiple SDK libraries for instrumenting our applications in different languages. So if you want to start uh, using feature flags with, with ConfigCat, um, how should I start? What are the steps? What do I need to do to start using feature flags? So for this demo, um, I will set up a very, very simple web page, just hello world with, with a small logo image. And we will change the image without even having to deploy any new version. We will have, um, we will see how our users are going to access a new, um, a new version of the application without even having to deploy any changes there. We will do it, uh, change it remotely. So this is the um, really simple example that I'm going to use. As you see, simple web server, 
Hello World with an image, in this case, Code Emotion logo, uh, in the gray color. Okay. So let's see what are the steps that I'm going to perform to, to do what I just mentioned. So um, let's see the steps that we'll need to follow to configure this with Conflict Cat. Okay. Uh, first thing we will need to log into Conflict Cat. And if we don't have it, sign up in the product and set up an account. It's free, no credit card needed. And we will create a feature flag. Um, in this case, as you see in the third image, I called it um, Code Emotion Logo Beta. So then we will have to instrument our application. Uh, that would be step two. We are going to see this in more detail in the next slide. And finally, uh, when we are ready, when we want to activate these chains in the feature flag, um, we will see a change in, in the logo image. So now, um, really simple, just three steps. Uh, I'm going to focus in the second uh, in the second step, the instrumentation of the of the application. Sorry about that. Um, so. This is the code of, of the really simple web page, um, really old HTML JavaScript. Um, it could be any kind of application um, and any languages, in this case, JavaScript. So the first thing we need is to import the config cat library. And this case is JavaScript, but other clients are available. And we need to provide the API key, which we can get from the config cat admin panel. Then, um, we read the feature flag, as you can see there, are code emotion log beta. And depending on the result, if it's true or false, we saw the new image or the old image. And in this case, it's just a change of the image, but we could see in real examples of our code that would be a completely different feature or um, a different design for the bait or what we want to really change there. And that's it. It's it's really simple example, but. Uh, I hope that uh, it inspired, it, you find it is inspiring uh, for, for your specific use cases. Okay, so um, let's go for today. Uh, this is the small uh, web page that I have uh, deployed and Google Cloud Run, by the way. And if we you can see that I'm a user, I'm mean, constantly accessing, and this is what I'm seeing, that this image in, in gray called emotion there. Now, we go to the config cat console. As you can see, it's very, very simple. Um, we have here defined the feature flag that I created, called emotion logo beta. And um, as you can see, we can, we can set up more complex um, configuration, like we could target a specific users only. Uh, we could also target a percentage of users generally, but this is uh, going to, I'm going to do this really easy and simple. So to all users and uh, well, we also see the different um, um, clients available in this case. And in this case, I'm using JavaScript, but you can see that it could be available for any that you are using, Goland, uh, Python, Node and so on. So the only thing that we want to do is whenever I want to change this feature for our users, I just need to uh, enable the feature flag here. So let's enable and uh, change saved and that's it. So if we go back through our applications, our users now are going to see this new logo with orange colors. So really, really simple. And uh, we have been able to change uh, a feature or design uh, from our users with even, with even needing to go for the step of deploy the new application into the infrastructure. So it has been automatically done because instead of doing this uh, infrastructure base, we are doing this uh, with feature flags with, with code. Okay, so this will be the second um, the second image that we see uh, code emotion logo again, but with the orange colors. And just to mention that we can implement a feature flag system as we have seen before um, with already existing applications, just um, integrating uh, the defined or the preferred system into the code, instrumenting this. 
but there are also other different um, platforms uh, available that will bring this feature, but also a lot more um, blended, uh, bundled into the same system. If we want to start a new project from scratch, uh, this might be a good choice, for example. Um, this, this example so here will be like Google Firebase. It's a platform that covers all needed requirements for deploying and developing our application into production. And it is focused on both web and mobile applications. It is building data-driven and analytics. This means that it comes with a lot of different tools which will help us to improve our application based on how our users are using it and making um, make the right decisions there. So tools like Google Analytics, predictions, machine learning, remote config, which has um, feature flags, and A-B testing to, to test our experiments there. As you can see, it is designed to make the user the most important resource, and uh, it also comes with a general free plan, not that I'm trying to sell it to you or, or anything. And um, that's it. So as a conclusion, yeah, switch on my features, like really uh, enable switch on dance with, with a button, and uh, the sentence of the presentation that we need to use the different continuous deploying approaches uh, to be user driven. So I will I will mention just as a conclusion the two aspects that we've been covering. Uh, the first one that we need to con constantly iterate, continuously deploy, continuously deliver value to our customers. And the second aspect and factor that we need to have into account is that we need to uh, do that uh, driven by our users. So we also need uh, a strategy that will allow us to gain, in, gain insights and feedback from how our users are, are using the the product or the software or the application that we are developing. Um, so thank you very much. And now I don't know if there have been any questions. Uh, thanks, Beatrice, uh, for uh, this webinar. Uh, and I remember that if you have any questions, you can make it on the question window, or you can raise your hand if you feel like uh, te text is not your friend. Um, super interesting webinar, uh, cool stuff, cool things uh, that you can do with a couple of lines of code. So thanks again, Beatrice. Uh, I'm giving some moments so people can write their questions. Uh, and I remember that in any case, uh, we'll be uh, posting this video if you, uh, well, this webinar if you miss it, uh, some part of it on uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, uh, one question here, uh, I don't know if you see it, um, Zilon's car. Is asking how much can these tools impact the actual size performance of our app site, app or site, I, I suppose. Beatrice? Sorry, I was, I was muted. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, this kind of, of uh, system and tools usually have uh, catch systems, uh, so they won't impact the locally so they will impact really the the users the performance okay cool well Ruben says congrats Beatrice so, <laughs> uh, so yeah a super super interesting webinar uh, let me see as uh, Zilon Scar says thanks uh, for the reply uh, let me check no, no, no further questions at the moment. In any case, um, uh, hope that you can share your slides uh, later. Uh, once we have the video, we can upload it to YouTube channel and share it on on our our social networks. So, in any case, uh, I think that you have your Twitter account over there. That people probably can reach uh, or mention. Yeah, sure. So, mention for, for any question. And I will also be um, uh, open to answer if you have any questions and very message me, so. Perfect, cool, cool. Uh, okay, uh, so without further uh, things, uh, thanks again, Beatrice. Uh, thanks for uh, the webinar and all the attendees, thanks for watching us and hope you enjoy this webinar and hope to see you soon in another webinar that we have. We will have some so, some more content on the Spanish uh, communities, 
we will have a webinar and a panel online next week. So stay tuned. Thanks. Thank you.